Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today. Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with James Poniewozik, the author of Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television, and the Fracturing of America. He is the chief TV critic for the New York Times and also wrote for Time Magazine for a long time. So thanks so much for being here, Mr. Poniewozik. Oh, thanks a lot for having me on, Evan. Well, before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We do not accept contributions over $5, and any monthly amount we raise over $31, which is the exact cost to produce the show, is given to charity. Now, this episode is being released in the beginning of October as we begin a month-long series on the presidency. We're doing one episode on each of the two major candidates, as well as a series of episodes examining the presidency itself. Our Biden episode is with biographer Stephen Levingston, and that is being released the same day as this one, so it is available right now. My goal for you is to get to know the two nominees better, not the people you see on TV, but who they really are. But when it comes to Donald Trump, as James writes, it is TV that has conquered America. To know Donald Trump, you have to know TV and vice versa. And I love his book because since he became president, so few sort of straight biographies have been written about Trump that examine him as opposed to some aspect of his presidency or his policy. And this is a biography of Trump through his relationship with television. So James, if I may call you James, um, you talk about an interview that he gave in 1980 on NBC to a morning TV personality named Rona Barrett. He was only 34 at the time, but she asked him, would you like to be president of the United States? He said no, because somebody with strong views couldn't get elected against somebody with no great brain, but a big smile. So what did he mean by that? So the interesting thing about that interview to me um, that sort of made it, you know, the nugget that I kick off the book with was, number one, I think it is very striking that... It is it basically an entertainment slash gossip reporter, Rona Barrett, who was who was a great entertainment and gossip reporter, was the first one to have the instinct to ask Donald Trump whether he would want to be president before anybody in the serious politics world considered it. Um, and number two, his answer is sort of telling because the reason that he gives uh, that he believed that nobody like him could be elected president was because of television. He said that, you know, in the television era, an Abraham Lincoln uh, could not get elected. He was somebody who came across as 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 sour and didn't have, you know, great personality. And this was, you will remember, 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan's running for president. And he is about to get elected uh, for, 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 among other reasons, because he is a trained performer who's extremely telegenic. Uh, and, and the interesting thing to me as somebody who is looking at Donald Trump as a product of television, his most important relationship slash enabler, is that at the time, he was absolutely right. Uh, That is, uh, in the television environment of 1980, where television was a mass medium, three networks, a broad mass audience, uh, television rewarded different types of performances and personalities than it does now. It, it needed people who, as Donald Trump was saying at the time, were sort of broadly pleasing and inoffensive and smiley uh, and able to ingratiate themselves. Uh, one reason that somebody like Donald Trump, who before he was a businessman, was, was sort of a, a tabloid-chasing celebrity, uh, somebody who courted controversy. The, the reason that somebody like him could rise as a political figure was in part because the media environment changed over those 40 years. And it became more fragmented and more polarized in ways that you know many of us may be broadly familiar with. The rise of cable, the rise of the internet, etc. Uh, and, and so that kind of sets up what I feel is like the dual story of my book, which is number one, the development of Donald Trump, basically the TV character over 40 years, and the changes in the medium of television over that same period that not only enabled his rise as a public figure, but really changed the language of politics and public life in many ways. So he says no to that question. Um, Describe what he does see ahead of him 
career wise. And I'm going to just feed you a little bit here. Um, I actually watched a larger portion of that interview. I called it up on YouTube and he says he doesn't want to go into politics because it's a mean life and that TV has ruined the political process. So he's almost saying I could go into it, but it's a mean life and TV means I can't be mean on yeah. pol in politics. So what does he see ahead of him career wise at that point? So at that point, he is seeing a career in business and real estate. But it's also important, you know, from, from the standpoint of this analysis to say that when he's talking about a career in real estate, he is largely talking about a career in publicity and in the media and public life. Uh, he was somebody he, he, he um, wrote or his ghostwriter wrote in The Art of the Deal who very early on in life once considered going off to L.A. and becoming a, a movie executive. You know, he was, was always attracted by the entertainment world and, and, and spectacle, and he decided against it ultimately. But what he said was, I decided I would go into real estate, which was his father's business, but he said, I'm going to put show business into real estate. And, and what he discovered was that by sort of cultivating the attention of tabloids, uh, by getting on the television by becoming a colorful, um, flamboyant figure who people like to interview and gave great quotes and, you know, got into controversies and so on. He could inflate the image of himself as a businessman. One interesting thing to note is that Rona Barrett is interviewing him for an NBC primetime special in 1980 before he's ever really done anything. I mean, he is, you know, he's done a few projects for his father's business, uh, so, you know, some development in, in Midtown Manhattan, but that's three years before Trump Tower even opens. He is, he is famous for being himself, for being a, a, a tabloid figure, and that is in many ways the foundation of his career, his image as a real estate mogul, which in turn will become the foundation for his image as a, as a pop culture and ultimately reality TV and then political figure. So before we go forward from 1980, let's go back to 1946 in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, he's, of course, born in 1946. So can you describe his early life just a little bit? Um, you say in, in your book that he had four human siblings, and then there was a fifth sibling, which was television. Uh, you said yeah. that he and TV grew up together. And one thing that I'll never forget from your book is the way you describe him noticing how much his mother loves television. She sits there and gazes at the TV. So how does that form him and what does he notice about what's on TV and its potential? So he's born in 1946 and that means that he is of that generation, that first generation that grows up entirely with TV. Uh, the, the, the Trumps uh, living in their mansion in Queens are one of the first families to have a color television. Uh, you know, he, he, is, he is one of this first generation of baby boomers that grows up knowing that there are two worlds, the physical world that they live in and this kind of magical world that comes into your living room through a box. And one thing that is really interesting to me, again, going back to you know, his, his first book about himself, The Art of the Deal, which was kind of central to his image making. The one really lengthy anecdote he tells about his childhood is about TV. And specifically, it's about watching his mother sit all day and watching the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1952, I believe it is, 53, I'm, not, I'm forgetting, but, but um, and how she's enraptured by it, you know, all day. And he says it's kind of this, this magic spell that TV can, can cast on people in a way that, you know, a, a, a business like real estate doesn't. And, you know, I think the, the insight that's developing in him early at that point, and then later as he becomes more and more fascinated with show business and merging show business with business, is that it, this, this, this sort of fake reality of television, this virtual reality of television is more powerful than actual reality, than actual concrete business, because if you can dominate it, you can dominate people's mindscapes. You know, it allows you to become ubiquitous, to reach millions of people, and to uh, really, really, um, uh, you know, ensnare them in a way that nothing else can. It, it's almost like this, this everyday magic that suddenly people are exposed to in their lives. One of the things that uh, um, 
we should do is at least mention his father a little bit because he did yeah. have two parents. Um, what does his dad teach him? Um, what the quote that I always remember is you are a king and you punch back twice as hard. Baking from our childhoods just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from the Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Yeah, his, his father, Fred Trump, uh, is a real estate mogul in his own right. Uh, he he founds the company that Donald Trump will eventually take over, and he is he is more based in outer borough real estate. But he is a an extremely competitive um, sort of brass tacks businessman. He introduces Donald and his siblings to the idea that there are killers and losers in the world. Right. And, and that he encourages his kid to be a killer, meaning, you know, you need to be ruthless. You need to compete. Life is zero sum in order for you to gain. Somebody else has to lose. And, you know, you need to always press your advantage. Never take your, your hand off the other guy's throat, you know, and and, and looking at him uh, compared with his mother and her sort of, you know, uh, taste for the, the 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 pageantry and spectacle of something like Queen Elizabeth's coronation. You see the two halves of what ultimately becomes the Donald Trump that we know. On the one hand, uh, this 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 sort of ruthless, pugilistic view of life as just a, a a competition to the death, and also this fascination with spectacle and attention uh, that that he sort of synthesizes into his his business career and, and his public career so you know so so from his father trump uh, fred trump he gets both his actual physical business and this mindset of life as an ugly competition which not only influences his business but really that's the rhetoric of his political campaign if you you know uh look at his campaign speeches in 2016 and now so uh, in 1980, TV has sort of grown up a little bit. TV is, I guess, uh, you know, maybe 40 years old at that point, um, or maybe a little bit younger than that, maybe 30, 30 35 years old. Um, he says that strong views in 1980, TV um, is not going to sort of accept them. The people who yeah. watch TV is not going, people who watch TV are not going to be drawn by these really strong views. So describe what we see in TV in 1980. So in 1980, the the big difference between then and now is that in 1980, television is about as mass a mass medium as it will ever be, Uh, you know, which means that, um, you know, through its early decades, um, television was carried by a few networks, which reached tens of millions of Americans each. Uh, you know, a, a popular show on ABC or NBC would have 40, 50 million viewers, you know, whereas now, you know, the most popular program in the country is lucky if it gets 10 or 15 million. Uh, it, you have these networks that basically have drawn together the largest collective audience that any phenomenon in history has. And that means they have a tremendous reach. It also means that there are specific sort of demands on them with regard to their content, which is that anything that you put on needs to, in order to be successful, appeal to a wide range of people, right? You know, historically, you think of the model of that era of television as being something like the Ed Sullivan Show, the variety program where you're putting on something for the adults and something for the kids. And, you know, everything kind of has to be for everybody. And that means not only is is the programming different, but the tone really is different. Uh, it needs to be more sort of reassuring and broadly appealing. 
uh, and, and it needs to, because of the business of television, right? You stay in business as an ABC or an NBC or a CBS in that kind of mass market by trying never to give people a reason to change the channel. You can't because offend you, them. You, you want them. You want them to, you know, be watching the same network when they turn on the TV in the morning as when they turned it off the night before. And so you had a concept in these early decades of television called the least objectionable program, uh, which means that, you know, uh, you, you know it, it's like inoffensive sitcoms and predictable dramas where the cops always catch the bad guys. It's this philosophy of never challenging your audience, never provoking them too much because you don't want to alienate anybody because you need to aggregate these audiences of tens of millions in order to have success. And, and that is very different, you know, just sort of to briefly encapsulate the 40 years of, of TV <laughs> history that followed from what we live in now, which is you have a cable channel for this audience and that audience and that audience, and you have a news channel for this political leaning and that political leaning. And you have, you know, you know, websites for everybody and you have social media bubbles for everybody. And you are, you are now not trying to give people a reason not to change the channel. You are trying to give people reasons to tune in, which means you are trying to produce much more provocative and specific content. Uh, and and that, is, that is one reason why the whole atmosphere of media today is very different from what we saw in 1980 at the height of this sort of mass mainstream audience. And so that means that the um, TV audiences are fractured, that instead of having 40 million people watching one show or 50 million people, um, you have to give a reason to the five or six million people who might watch it or fewer or more, but generally that many, um, in order to tune in to you. And therefore you can be much more provocative and you can be much more sort of out there because you have to grab them by the throat. Yeah, I mean, just to give you a non-political example from the phenomenon that was would start to emerge shortly after 1980 with the development of cable TV, you start having channels develop like MTV, where whereas the principle of Ed Sullivan was, okay, we're going to have the Beatles, but we're also going to have puppet shows. There's something for everybody. You can sit down and watch it with your parents. The whole appeal of MTV is your parents are going to hate this. This is just for you. We don't want 50 million people watching it. We want the right couple million people watching it. We want this age group. We want people with these particular tastes. And the fact that we are alienating so many other people means that we're programming to you better. Now, that is a broad sort of uh, you know, attitude that develops in media of the fragmented area, era uh, that goes well beyond politics, but it certainly ultimately uh, affects the political tone of media when you move into the era of, you know, individuated cable news channels and talk radio, et cetera. So in the 1980s, Donald Trump starts to realize, and this is a great sentence from your book, that there was more upside to playing a businessman than there is in being a businessman. Uh, exactly. First and foremost, before he was a businessman, he played the character of a businessman, which means that he had a profile first in the New York, New York tabloids and local New York media, and then ultimately as he becomes a more, uh, a, a, a bigger tabloid figure and the art of the deal comes out, he becomes sort of a, 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 a national boldface name. Um, he is, he is more known for being a real estate mogul than he is an actual real estate mogul. You know, in other words, in the world of New York business, he's one of several moderately successful real estate executives. But he is the guy that you see on TV. You know, he is the guy that you see Phil Hartman playing on Saturday Night Live. He's the guy that you see on 60 Minutes and picking fights with Ed Koch and, you know, on the cover of the New York Post. Uh, and, and that allows him to become sort of part of this, you know, like public uh, mental shorthand for wealth right? He is the public cartoon, like the guy in the Monopoly box of successful rich guy. And 
on, you know, on one hand, that sort of indulges his inbred need for attention and to be, you know, the, 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 the center of the public spectacle, but it also has very real business uh, benefits for him. Uh, it's branding. It means that when you put Trump on a building or you license the word Trump to somebody else, uh, that becomes, you know, imbued with this certain, uh, you know, pizzazz and, and uh, idea of glamour, and it allows you to, to, to charge more for it. Uh, and, and it makes you more attractive, say, to lenders who, you know, have, have seen your name. So it is, it is sort of a cycle of business, of actual real estate business and publicity, where publicity is by far the, the bigger part of it, the bigger generating engine. So uh, one thing that you say that that's really interesting um, is that in the 1990s um, is really when he defines himself even more so than the 80s. I mean, looking back yeah. now, we often say, oh, well, you know, 80s was this decade of greed and he sort of takes over New York and all those things. But you really say that the 90s is when Donald Trump becomes Donald Trump. Yeah. Why do you say that and how does he do it? Ironically, this is this is a very influential period for what he eventually becomes, partly because his actual business collapses. Uh, as he, you know, in, through the 1980s, as as he grows and grows his businesses and makes all these high profile acquisitions, right, a, a football team, an airline, he overextends himself in business, and you know, it basically goes bankrupt by the the end of the decade. And he is, because of his sort of public media profile, able to work out a deal with his creditors where he is kept afloat and uh, it loses direct control of much of his business, but is given an allowance to keep up appearances because he has to, to play this flamboyant, glitzy, fabulous character of Donald Trump in order to keep up that brand that the Trump name is attached to. Uh, and, and that means that, you know, after the early 90s or so, he is, his job is less real estate and finding deals and executing those deals than it is playing the character of Donald Trump and building this character of Donald Trump. And this is the decade in which he starts uh, doing movie and sitcom cameos. He's in Home Alone 2, uh, you know, welcoming Macaulay Cul Culkin to the Plaza Hotel, which at that point is already going into a prepackaged bankruptcy, right? And, and he doesn't really own anymore, but in the world of Hollywood, he still owns it because he's the face of it. He's the guy who plays the character of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he's on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He's on Spin City. He he, he is building this media figure where there's a benefit to the programs that want to use Donald Trump because you need, you know, you have this scene where a famous rich guy appears and Donald Trump has made himself into that mental shorthand for people. He's the guy who you know is a rich guy. And they give him the benefit of keeping his reputation afloat, which redounds to the success of his businesses, which are now you know, largely other people's businesses that he's lending his name to. So the 90s, in other words, it, it's so important to what he ultimately becomes as sort of a public performer uh, and, and a, a, a celebrity in itself, because that's the point at which playing the character of Donald Trump becomes his real job more than actually being the businessman Donald Trump. The, the, the media figure Donald Trump has to bail out the businessman Donald Trump in the 90s. And what you write is that he's not a particularly good actor. In fact, he's very stiff. Um, yeah. But he's always sort of, you say that he is not talking to the characters on the show. He is talking, you are watching your favorite actors talk to him. It's almost like these weird moments where like suddenly the characters are not even in the show anymore, that they're yeah. just talking to Donald Trump. And the, yeah, that's, that's kind of what this sort of stunt casting does. It's this weird meta moment where you know, okay, Donald Trump is not on the Fresh Prince really acting because he can't really act. Uh, but the appeal, the thing that makes it funny and kind of a neat surprise for the audience is, oh, look, there's famous rich guy Donald Trump showing up and talking to the actors on my favorite show. Uh, and, and that, you know, number one, 
again, that sort of, you know, underscores his image as the kind of pop cultural representation of wealth in America. And it's an example of over and over again, there's a specific kind of performance that Donald Trump does well in. These areas in which he's not real, he's not, he's not an actor in the sense that Ronald Reagan was able to, you know, uh, display emotions that he doesn't have or, you know, uh, uh, inhabit other characters. Mm. He succeeds in these environments in which there is sort of this fuzzy boundary between the real and the fake, uh, whether it is, you know, performing in cameos, whether it is reality TV on The Apprentice, whether it is professional wrestling, which he's ultimately involved in. Uh, you know, it's, it's all these environments where it's kind of true, but it's kind of fake. And he kind of skates in that, that fuzzy boundary. How does The Apprentice happen? One of the things you say is that um, at that time, um, it, was a po- it was possible to do the show The Apprentice. If they had tried The Apprentice in the 80s, who's going to sit around and not be offended by a guy firing a bunch of people? But in the 90s and in the, and in the early 2000s, it starts to be acceptable. It starts to be yeah. something kind of funny and fun to watch. So how does The Apprentice happen? Um, and were the ratings as good as he said? Um, you know, so, so, so TV history wise, yeah, reality TV in general it can only become big business in part because of the fragmentation of the media. It's a phenomenon that mostly comes out of cable. MTV is the real world, et cetera, et cetera. And it crosses over into the bigger networks through originally Survivor on CBS, which is a, a massive hit. Its producer, Mark Burnett, decides, I want to do survivor set in the business world he wanted to you know he wanted to produce a show that he could do at home in new york and, you know not have to travel to borneo uh to, to to produce it and so on so it's going to be survivor set in the business world and i need a host well who's the host that 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 you go to the, the ideal sort of host for this is not necessarily somebody who is the most successful businessman in new york at the time because the actual business you know is is boring and non-telegenic you want somebody who when you put them on a camera people think wealth and success and you know fabulous glitz and donald trump has been playing that character as we've been saying for for decades at this point uh he comes with his own props he comes with his own symbols and uh, uh, mark burnett who gets this brainstorm when he is hosting when he is at the uh, uh, fourth season of Survivor's finale in Central Park, where Donald Trump uh, financed the restoration of of Woolman Rink and was you know uh, uh, smart enough to plaster his name all over it. Uh, he gets that lightning bolt and realizes that Donald Trump, this guy who has been playing himself as a larger than life character in the media for 20 years, uh, is is uh, you know the the perfect guy to cast as its boss, as its host. Um, are the ratings actually great? Um, they are for a short amount of time. Uh, it's it's quite a big hit. Its first season, its last week of season one, the finale, is the highest rated show on TV that week. Um, And then, as often happens in television, it becomes overexposed. NBC runs too many seasons of it. Um, Donald Trump has become sort of a pop culture smash again with his catchphrase, you're fired. And they milk that and make the show more and more about him and viewers kind of burn out on that. And the ratings decline precipitously. Now, one thing that we see, which we see in Donald Trump's relation to numbers in many other fields, is that he he latches on to that one week that it was the number one show on television to claim for the next 10 years that it is still the number one show on television. Uh, it is, it, 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 as I've said, you know, I've said before, um, the controversy over how many people showed up to Donald Trump's inauguration would be no surprise to you if you covered the TV business during the 2000s when Donald Trump was regularly lying about his ratings to to TV critics. How do his appearances on Fox News start? Suddenly his views don't have to be tamped down. Strong views, as he calls them, um, are suddenly part of the mainstream, at least TV audience, um, for at least one segment of TV consumers. So how and when does Donald Trump get invited to be on Fox News? 
So, so you know, Donald Trump's career is, is this, it's like this chain of this, without this thing, this thing wouldn't have happened. Without that thing, that one thing wouldn't have happened. His sitcom persona in the 90s lands him on The Apprentice, and his, his renewed stardom on The Apprentice makes him a popular guest to be booked on cable news shows uh, during that period. Um, one of them uh, is Fox and Friends where he starts appearing one of one of his his favorite fox programs now as as president but where he starts doing a weekly segment in 2011 called mondays with trump and you know he's he's the same donald trump in many ways that he was in 1980 when he told rona barrett that people could never stomach somebody like him running for president but suddenly being outspoken being brash thinking you're right about everything being willing to you know uh, uh, knock other public figures, in this case, Obama, who at the time he was saying, you know, was, was, had been born in Kenya, uh, right? This is around the time of the birtherism uh, 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 controversy. Uh, suddenly, that's something that draws a big audience. There's, there's, there's a, a, a red meat audience on Fox News that loves the idea of hearing this celebrity from TV, you know, sort of reiterate their opinions back at him. So the the apprentice is really the gateway to him uh, going on the going on cable news generally, and then Fox in particular, where he really hits it off. And, and even if you were, you know, a, a close watcher of The Apprentice for all the years that it was on, you might not even realize that for four years before he declared for president, Donald Trump had a regular segment on Fox and News every week for, for four years. That was probably in many ways more important to him establishing the political bond with the Fox News base, uh, more, more, more important to his political aspirations than even The Apprentice was. And then Twitter comes. So how does Trump start his Twitter account um, you wrote that at first his tweets are not necessarily political, but then he realizes, whoa, if I pour some sugar here, the ants are going to swarm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, the very, in the very early years, he's, uh, months, he starts like a lot of celebrities start out on Twitter. It's these sort of anodyne publicity tweets that actually the original ones were written by his book publicist. Uh, somewhere around the, t really around the time that he starts going on Fox and Friends regularly, um, almost like he flicked a switch. His tweets become very political and, 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 and very contentious. Um, almost, almost overnight. And it is originally on Twitter where he starts raising uh, his insinuations that Barack Obama was not born in the United States is, and is ineligible to be president. That was, you know, at, at the time, even too hot for Fox. Once he makes it a controversy on Twitter, then it starts to be something that TV news starts to cover. And then he's talking about it on Fox. Then he's talking about it on, on CNN. Uh, but this, this Twitter persona, so this Twitter persona sort of works in tandem with the outspoken, in-your-face political persona that he's modeling on Fox. But the difference is that social media is interactive. Uh, and to somebody like Donald Trump, craves an audience and who craves the gratification of attention, it's even better because you're instantly seeing how many likes and retweets you get. You're instantly getting, you know, cheers and, and interactions. And you are able to see, you know, for somebody with this sort of built-in gut instinct of, you know, kind of uh, appealing to hitting that nerve that gets people's attention, he's able to use it really basically like a, a sophisticated, intuitive focus group. Suddenly you see, oh, once I'm, you know, when I'm tweeting about immigration, those tweets just go wild. Uh, you know, when I tweet about this, I get a lot of engagement. When I tweet about that, less so. And one of the things that starts to happen is then the tweets are now driving TV news. And you wrote, I'll never forget this, you wrote, he gets to be the one lucky boy in all of history who gets to speak to the TV and have the TV speak back to him. 
Yeah, exactly. It's the, this fantasy that you had when you were three years old that there were real people on the other side of TV and that you could go into it and interact with them. For Donald Trump, it's actually true. And part of that is, yes, because as he becomes, you know, a, a bigger, notorious um, a, a political slash celebrity figure through birtherism, through his rise in the Republican Party, you, you remember in, in 2012, uh, you know, before he runs for president, all the Republican candidates are, are bowing and scraping to him for his endorsement because he's become so influential with this, this corner of, of the Fox News audience. And uh, what that means is that, you know, in many ways, uh, and we certainly see this through his whole presidency, but even back then, his Twitter feed becomes a way of programming the news. He, he, can, he can go on Twitter and make some outrageous declaration, and suddenly that is itself news. Uh, once he becomes president, that's, that's, that, you know, it, it's amplified because you know, many days cable news is basically entirely programmed by his Twitter feed. Talk about the red light and his ability to keep it on. Um, you say it's basically his friend, um, and meaning the red light of the TV camera that shows yeah. which camera is lit up or which camera is on the air. Um, one thing about covering the Trump White House is that there's always news, always news, and that yeah. you know this is his instinct at work. Yeah, w once he starts running for president and after he's become president, you see everything that he's learned you know, becoming a creature of television go into to work. And, and one of those things is his almost like subconscious understanding of the appetites of the camera. That the way, you know, that, that the electronic news media is this hungry beast and you always have to give it something more outrageous, more interesting, a bigger car crash in order to keep its attention. The way he described it to, uh, 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 he described the campaign to a reporter from the Washington Post was when he would go to his rallies, he said, sometimes, you know, he, he would sense the crowd drifting off, but the people in, in the rally crowd didn't necessarily matter so much. What mattered to him was I always had to say something new to keep the red light on, which was the red light of the TV camera, which meant that his rallies were be carrying, uh, carried on the air live. And that ability to shock and provoke and you know, inflame the media with outrageous statements um, translated practically into billions of dollars of free advertising. That's why we got this phenomenon in 2016 of you know, CNN showing his empty podium before a rally because the news was Donald Trump was gonna come out and open his mouth and who knows what crazy thing he's gonna say. Uh, and, and and having been, you know, certainly it helped him, having been uh, a, a reality TV performer for years, uh, having been somebody who, you know, worked at getting his name into the New York tabloids for years, uh, he, he, he understood in a way that other politicians have to pay, you know, consultants incompetent for, consultants yeah. to do how to get his name in the headlines and just become the protagonist of the election. It used to be that presidential rallies, and I've been to many of them, uh, certainly for President Obama, an administration that I covered um, as a reporter in Florida and in New York. It used to be that rallies would start at one, two, three, four in the afternoon, and there would be a theme, and the president, whoever it was, would give this sort of serious speech about what they were there to talk about. They would shake some hands, and it would get a lot of local media coverage. Um, maybe some national news would, would cover it. You know, a, a piece of the speech might be on, but it wasn't the entire thing. When, and I've been to dozens of, of Trump rallies. Those rallies are now prime time. They're seven, eight o'clock at night because that is just his instinct. Um, and you write that he makes these rallies events unto themselves. Uh, it's almost like, you know, like a Grateful Dead show or something like that. Like it, it is, it is a concert review spectacle in itself that a lot of the people showing up, you know, even, even though they may be, you know, very political true believers, there's also just sort of a, you know, um, a, an entertainment spectacle aspect. Of it. It's like they're getting together with a community and they're seeing the show that's going to be put on and there's music and there's, there's, there's warm up speakers and there's this, this feeling of like a, a concert spectacle, uh, which is, you know, it, 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 that 
it's underscored in part by Trump's style at the rallies, where he's he's much more at home, riffing for an hour, sort of like an improv it's like stand up. comedian. Yeah, it's like stand up. No, oh, a- absolutely. Uh, down to just his rhythms and his patter and the the just the flow of his sentences and his thoughts. Um, that's where he's really in his element, you know, compared to reading a speech off the teleprompter. Uh, th- so, so, you know, that contributes to this atmosphere in the rallies and in the rooms where he is also, by the way, often playing with some really dangerous and ugly sentiments and emotions and exciting sometimes you know, violence in the, the the very rallies that he's at. But also, you know, it's not just about that room. It's about the spectacle that he's providing for the news networks. And he is very conscious, as you referred to, of the notion of when is this going to play best on TV? You know, playing, having things happen in prime time when there's going to be the biggest TV audience. Uh, you know, and you you see that reflected in his presidency, even when he started holding, say, the coronavirus briefings uh, earlier earlier this fall, he started holding them at around 5:30 or so every day. Why? Because that's when local news starts coming on, and you're getting into network evening news, and you are, you know, potentially reaching a broad audience of of news. Now you could. We can argue about whether that actually benefited him this time in, in the polls. But that's his instinct, yeah. Yeah, but but it, it's a very canny instinct for for grabbing attention. Whether that ten, ten, attention always benefits him is another question. Uh, but he certainly knows how to get it. Let's talk a little bit about the reality show presidency. You alluded to it. Um, we saw the RNC kind of become this, and especially because it was virtual, it kind of becomes this this television performance stage. Um, we saw it at the beginning of his of his administration as he's got the cameras are in Trump uh, in the lobby, and you were watching people go up and down these elevators. Yep. And sometimes he would come downstairs and make an appearance. And then Kanye West was there, and he's he's courting Mitt Romney, and there's this kind of constant sense that he is, um, for better or worse, doing a performance, that this is a field of performance for him. He at one point tells his aides that they should view every day of his presidency as an episode of a reality show in which the president defeats his em- enemies. Uh, you he know, told and, his aides that. He is, yeah, and he's very conscious uh, you know, at, at all times that just as on a reality show, the appearance of a thing is more important than the reality of a thing. So it becomes important to him early on in his administration that the people that he hires, quote unquote, look the part. Uh, when, he, when he hires uh, General Mattis, for instance, uh, whom, whom he later had a falling out with, but as uh, the Secretary of Defense, he's, he's captivated by his nickname, Mad Dog Mattis, right? Because, because of course, of course, Donald Trump, the guy who is, you know, concerned with TV symbolism and you know, the image of a thing above all, who's he going to imagine as Secretary of Defense? It's going to be a general, and he's going to have a nickname like Mad Dog. You know, he, 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 would, he would have to create that if it didn't already exist. And in fact, at the day of his inauguration, he tells Mad Dog Mattis, uh, you know, General, if I were, if I were casting a movie, you know, your central casting, I would, I would put you in it. And, and that was really in many ways how he casted his, his administration with people that he had seen on television and that he liked or people that he thought would be very good on television. What do we know about his viewing habits as president? This is a president who loves TiVo and he often says, TiVo is the greatest invention. I love it. It's fantastic. How is he reactive or how reactive is he to what's on TV? He became president in many ways by programming television. You know, a big part of his success in the 2016 election and primaries and general election was his ability to command the attention and become the main character on TV. In many ways, since he's been president, TV has programmed him. You know, there is this symbiosis that we talked about where Trump says or does something outrageous on Twitter, and that becomes... Uh, you know, this, the, the, the fodder for cable news outrage and agita all day. But we've also had entire news cycles where his actions have been driven by 
kids seeing something on cable news and getting worked up about it or or angry and responding to it uh you know during a, a government shutdown uh he you know at some points he would take hardline positions because somebody on fox said that he was getting rolled by his adversaries uh so so we started to see particularly uh you know it, during his presidency that he he was not just a tv personality he was as we have seen a particularly a cable news addict uh who has watched although he oddly and kind of transparently denies it uh sometimes watches hours and hours of fox and other cable news a day and it has a big influence on his mood and on his actions and it, 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 in many ways it, it kind of determines you know what's going on in america at that time he's he's very much driven by the things that he's getting worked up by on television and he talks to the tv on twitter and then sometimes he even calls in as president and does an hour interview and then the tv talks back to him it's just it is this amazing feedback loop he's almost like this kind of transhuman being like has never existed in in humanity before who has has a dual life both both as the most powerful person in the world and the most ubiquitous character in television um and and there's this yeah there is this there is this feedback loop that takes place uh and there's also this you know this sense that um he is uh he is able to both be the center of the story and watch the story at at the same time and and this gets back to this idea of you know him as you know this sort of narcissistic uh a a a a, a attention seeking figure who is always concerned with his publicity right so so even back when he was you know an an executive in new york he would have he would have his media appearances recorded and saved on videotape so he could pull them out in trump tower and watch them again as sort of an ego boost now he's president and the president is the star of the news so there there are there are news channels on tv where he is the main subject 24 hours a day how could he ever resist not watching it hours and hours a day i thought it was a really revealing moment that he had with chris wall i think it was no you know it may not have been the chris wallace interview but it was a tv interview that he did and he's basically pulling words out of thin air to show that he can remember them and that this test that he was given to show that yeah. the test he was given he is um he is a cognizant person and he pulls these words out of thin air it seems to be at least and he goes person woman man camera tv oh, and which, t yeah. and tv is the one that he he ended on um that it's basically the to... donald trump hierarchy of being right <laughs> like like person generally woman then man's above the woman cameras above the man and tv is like the the top of the pyramid um it's his person five words it's like if i were writing a novel you know you would you would tell me that was too on the nose will the next president whether it's joe biden or if donald trump wins again it'll be someone else will the next president get this much coverage uh if, it, I, I, if it's joe biden probably not uh you know in part because part of joe biden's campaign promise is i'm going to give you a chance to turn off the tv for a while mm -hmm. uh you know uh, you will not have to look at your phone every morning and wonder what the president said. Uh, you will be able to ignore my speeches for weeks at a time. Uh, and, you know, this is this is more your field as a student of history. But, you know, that that American presidents are often a reaction to the, the president who came before them in can one way or another. Can TV survive I, without him? Um. Yes, uh, although you know, I think that that cable news ratings will will take will take a hit. Um, I, th I think F Fox. I think Fox News will survive well without Trump uh, if he loses or whenever he leaves office, because Fox has had they're sort of this this amazing sort of they have this amazing ability to generate anxious interest in their audience no matter what you know when 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 bush lost and obama became president people started talking about well this is the end for fox right but the obama years were a boom time for them if you have an interested partisan audience 
winning helps you and losing helps you. You just, you, you pivot, uh, you know, uh, you, you pivot to adapt to it. I will be interested, I would be interested to see what, say, a Biden presidency does to CNN's ratings uh, or MSNBC's because there may be big news for other reasons, but you will not necessarily have a presidency whose main purpose is to generate media outrage and, and news. You know, that said, the fact that we've had a Donald Trump means that that's sort of a path to the presidency now. So there are likely to be future presidents who get that sort of attention. Um, one thing we've always heard is that he has this idea of starting his own TV network. Have you done any reporting that indicates that's the case? Um, I have not personally, but I've, I've followed it. I know that he has had interest. I think that he would have very likely tried to start or partner with some sort of media organization if he had lost in 2016. I'm skeptical about the idea of him um, founding, as people have talked about, a competitor to Fox and succeeding with it. Largely for the boring reasons that it is just very difficult to launch a you know overnight, deep-pocketed, uh, successful competitor to an established cable news network and to get you know, boring things like carriage on cable systems and things like that. However, I will remind you that one of the uh, uh, sort of dubious highlights of Donald Trump's resume in the 1980s was uh, being part of the founding of the USFL, which was an attempt to create a, cre a, a competitor to the NFL that he couldn't resist doing because he like the glamorous idea of being a football team owner. And, and it, it, it existed for, you know, a couple of years and then it flamed out. So I could certainly see him trying it uh, because he's not going to just quietly give up attention. And that's, you know, probably the, the uh, short of running for president again, the logical next step for him is some sort of media enterprise. Um, I don't know how comfortable you are answering this question, but I'm, I'm going to ask it because um, sure. for, by, for students of history and for biographers who are a bit interested in psychology, which I am, um, it always sort of comes back to the mother, right? Everything sort of comes back to the mom um, with a, someone who rises to the level of becoming president. Is his obsession with TV a way to subconsciously win the approval from his mother, who we know was a somewhat distant person who was obsessed with watching television? Um, we know, and you know, we've heard from biographers that he had sort of formative traumatic experiences around his mother, who I believe was, was very ill at one point early in his childhood. And so there is, there is a sense of like anxiety and, and potential loss of her and distance at that point. Um, so, you know, armchair, armchair psychology suggests that that's partly a factor, but I think, you know, just relying on his own words and description of himself, um, you know, I do think that a formative aspect of his psychology that drew him to the notion of, of glamour and celebrity um, was the fact that his mother was drawn to entertainment, was drawn to pageantry, uh, and that he saw that, you know, possibly as a way of impressing her. You, you could say that, you know, the sort of dual aspects, the, the business side and the entertainer side of him is him alternatively, alternatively trying to impress the mother and trying to, you know, or trying to reach the mother and trying to impress the father. Hmm. It may also explain, and this is, this is it's a little bit of armchair psychology that I get it to in my book, one of the most fascinating contradictions to myself with Donald Trump as, as president with TV is, as we've been talking about, he's cultivated TV, he owes you know, much in his life to TV, and yet he's constantly denying how much TV he watches. He's, he's tweeted, I have very little time to watch television. I'm uh, mostly reading documents. He he did this even even recently uh, during a, a, a his his response to a, a 
uh, one, one of his coronavirus briefings, where he was he was claiming, you know, I just really I'm too busy. I don't have much time to watch television. And then listed this amazing litany of Fox shows that he had seen just in the past 24 hours. And it's astonishing. You sort of wonder, like, why? Like, TV has given you everything in your life. Why would you sort of deny this deepest love of yours? And part of it, I think, may go back to the father side of that, where, you know, Fred Trump was somebody who sort of, you know, didn't have time for television and saw, you know, watching it as, as, as a waste of time. And I think that there is a part of him that sees sitting in front of the TV as kind of passive and babyish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the the side of him that wants to appeal to Fred Trump wants to position himself as the active document reading head of states who has no time for television. Uh, but then he keeps talking for 90 seconds more, and it's, it's obvious that he is very, very much watching tons and tons of TV, possibly more than I do when I do it for a living. James Poniewozik, the author of Audience of One, Donald Trump Television and the Fracturing of America. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was a great talk. Well, certainly check out that book and also his work in the New York Times and his Twitter account, which is at Poniewozik. And remember, our episode on former Vice President Biden's background is now available as well as we explore his life through his relationship with former President Obama. For the rest of this month, we're going to have four more episodes. They're going to be examining campaigning, whether the presidency is too difficult of a job for one person to do alone, the history of the cabinet, and also how presidents shape political rhetoric. I do also want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. It's patreon.com slash History. We do not accept contributions over $5, and any monthly amount we raise over $31, the exact cost to produce the show, will be given to charity. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Be sure to check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks. 